Hello, welcome to the Non-Obvious Beyond Diversity Summit. You are joining the fashion panel where we're discussing diversity in fashion and if there is enough of it. Uh, my name is Sabina. I'll be moderating today. Uh, I'm an FIT graduate. Um, I also am an actor and a host and currently I'm a hospitality and brand consultant for a property management group. So let me introduce you to our amazing panel of fashion experts. Uh, to start, we have Pammy Umbanga, who is a fashion designer, and her line is Pammy Umbanga. Hi, Pammy. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? Thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Glad to be here. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Louis Arandia, a men's suit designer in Los Angeles. Uh, Louis Arandia Designs. Hi, Hi Louis. Thank Hello. Thank you for having me. Yes. Welcome. Uh, we also have Chipo Wami, who's with us. Uh, she does a designer, and her line is Panache Designs. Hi, everybody. Thank Hi, you. Hi, welcome. Yep. And finally, we have Jackie Megiddo, who is a Hollywood makeup artist. And her line of cosmetics is Jackie Megiddo Cosmetics. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hi. So, Jackie, uh, let me start with you. I wanted to hear a little bit about what you do and your makeup line. I know that uh, your approach to makeup is to enhance your natural beauty. So tell me a little bit more about your, your principle and, and your work. So I am a Hollywood makeup artist and I work a lot on a lot of TV shows, but I also own a cosmetic brand which started in Africa and now it is in the UK and it's in America. It is for us, it is all about being inclusive, but mostly about how you feel when you have the makeup on because it's for everybody. And also the education aspect of it is a big deal for us. Sure, sure. And I, I really, I've always felt that uh, makeup isn't to completely change how you look, but to enhance certain features, maybe draw back certain features that you're, you don't love. You know, so that's 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 wonderful. Hundred percent. I mean, you know, makeup grows with the times, and you know how you put your makeup on when you were younger, and how you put your makeup on when you're older are two different things. And this is what we really concentrate on. And and the the whole how it feels is where it comes in. Because when you're younger, you can afford to just go crazy and be a little bit more creative when you're older it's all about fixing the things that you that have pretty much disappeared on you and, sure. so that's what we want and don't you think do. less is more as you get older well it depends it really depends on your mood and personality doesn't it sure, uh, sure. the truth of the matter is uh when you're older you're going to put on a little bit more the trick is to make it look less nice very nice you'll have to tell us your secrets <laughs> Um, so I want to talk to Chipo. Chipo, how are you doing? Doing well, thank you. And so I know that you have traveled from Zimbabwe. Yeah. Um, you lived in Chicago. You lived in Texas. Now you're in Los Angeles. So tell us about your journey in fashion and how this all came about. So um, my fashion line started because I was a single mom and um, I was just trying not to be like the typical or, you know, like, a statistic. And so I, I started a fashion line just to help myself and to help other single moms as well. And before you know it, it grew up, it grew into something bigger than I was expecting. And I started doing fashion shows in Dallas. And then later on, I uh, traveled to um, California because I got married. And now mm -hmm. uh, still, I'm, I'm, I'm in the aerospace industry, but I am getting my fashion line off the ground again. Good and it's all about African inspired fashion because it's all derived from my, you know, from my heritage. Sure, that's great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next we have Louis Arandia. He's a brilliant men's suit designer. He's dressed some of the most prominent LA people. Yes. Tell so us. So my story goes, I started at 14 years old in the clothing business, had no idea that I'd take it up for my career. And it became my passion and to from fabric to consulting a gentleman, how to wear a suit. What event are you going to? 
Are you interviewing? Are you going to a graduation? Are you graduating? Uh, for instance, this one young man said, well, my professor said address my best and he wore a tuxedo to his graduation. Wrong. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> but and I coached them after what to wear. So it's about transformation, getting them to the next level. And yes. I'm really passionate about that. And knowing what to wear when. Correct. Kind of having a little bit of an idea of how, how clothes work. Right. It's some, um, you know, fashion changes. Now it's a little bit more tapered. Uh, it's not so yeah. baggy. And yeah. some of the older guys are like having a hard time with it. They but haven't gotten the memo. They haven't gotten the memo <laughs> right. yet. So I coach them and I, I kind of do the silhouette where they're happy with it. So and Great. it makes me happy and, and they're out there in the world looking sharp. So yeah, yeah. thanks to you. Yes. Um, next up we have Pammy, Pammy Mbanga. Hi. Hi. Pammy has a beautiful line of um, dresses and clothing for women that I think are so feminine um, and Parisian and super comfy. Uh, Pammy, tell us about your line. So my line started last year. Um, once COVID hit, um, I was laid off. And uh, I've worked in the industry for years. So I've worked for corporate companies and small companies. Um, some of them were actually fast fashion. And when COVID hit, a lot of companies weren't able to deliver their goods. And so there was so much waste. There was already a lot of waste in the industry. And once COVID happened, it really exposed this. And so I wanted to take the time to be more creative, be more sustainable and thoughtful with my designs rather than um, lean towards like a fast fashion idea. And so all my pieces are made to order. Um, and we're moving on to bridal, a bridal line soon, which is also made to order. Okay, great. A bridal line. Yes. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Okay, so everyone, we're, we're all here. Um, let's just get right into it. So again, this conversation is really about diversity and fashion. And is there enough of it? If there isn't, um, what can we all do as people in this industry to help bring more of it, to help people see themselves more in the pages of magazines and on the commercials? Um, so let's just get right into it. I'm going to start with um, a question or a thought, uh, or a question actually. So how large of a role do you feel that fashion plays in, in our culture? I feel that fashion plays a large role um, because that's what everyone sees. That's everyone, what everyone wears um, from athletes to celebrities to just regular people. Think about what you wear every day. Um, everyone's so influenced by fashion and there's just no getting away from it, even the movies and celebrities. So I feel like fashion does play a large role in our culture. Um, just no matter where you look, you are looking at fashion. And Lewis, what do you think? Like how, how important is it for men? Are, are men uh, being influenced by these types of things? So, so for, for men in fashion, you have one shot when you when you appear at a certain event. Sorry, they're gonna judge you on what you're wearing, <laughs> and there's no doubt. You know, if you're sure. disheveled, the wrinkled shirt, you know, your suits outdated. So, you. Yeah, so it, it's very important to dress to the nines and to be groomed, have the right haircut, the right shoes, and in the Latino culture, they they take pride. They, I see. And I'm at a men's club and they're getting their shoes shine. And at the tailor, we're tailoring men and everything's getting fitted now. Before it was just one size fits all. Now you have a medium fit, a slim fit. And for the really thin guy, he wants extra slim. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, that's for the different, that's for the young, for the young man. But for a man, it's like I said earlier, it's about transformation, about looking your best. And with some gentlemen, they don't even have time. So I go to their home, I go to their office, I bring them their, their suits there. It's not buying it out of a box now where the box gets there and you have to figure it out. No, I'm there hands on. And I think that's what fashion's about, being hands on. And I'm sure these ladies could relate to that. Yes, what do you think, Jackie and Chipo? 
So for me in the industry, a lot of times when I'm doing movies or if I'm doing anything to do with TV, fashion plays a really big role because what happens is this is what's going to give each person who either has a character or each person that's playing a judge or contestant, it gives them the sense of confidence and it's also about branding these days so you get any celebrity they have to brand themselves because there's so many judges there's so many actors there's so many celebrities out there so if you don't stand out people are going to forget about you and what fashion does fashion dresses your brand and you become a brand okay thank you i totally agree with jackie um i think Fashion is more about like your statement because every time you, you're dressed in something, you, you're going out you know, on the streets, you are making a statement to people around you and everybody who gets to see you, they will um, form their own perception of you based on their first, you know, the first look at you. So it's definitely a statement. It's definitely saying, hey, look at me. This is who I am. This is what I'm about. And uh, before they even get to get to really know you, they've already known a little bit about you. So I think, uh, yeah, fashion plays a major role in, in our culture. Yeah. Sure, and it's not always it's not always fair, but it's the truth. It's yeah. the truth. It is the truth. The truth. Um, so, and everyone, feel free to jump in when you feel like it. Do you, do we feel like there is enough diversity in fashion at the moment? I don't think so because you know, as much as people are creative a lot of times they're stereotypes. So for example, there's so many cultures and traditions and people dress differently and look differently. And because people are um, a little ignorant in terms of cultures, because you know we always place people in different sects. And what tends to happen is if somebody dresses a certain way, people are already assuming that they're a certain type of person. And with that, it mainly happens with a lot of like, for example, Africans or anyone that is from any, any other culture that's not very well known. And what yeah. tends to happen with that is you can lose a job or people just stigmatize you. Sure. And, um, and fashion, because right now we've got so many new designers coming up and they've got different tastes like different, you know, likings and and uh, giving them that opportunity or that platform to come up with new designs. And it's almost like, I, I liken fashion to, to music. You know, there's so many different genres out there. People can pick and choose whatever they want. So it's same thing with fashion, you know, there's so many different um, voices out there. So um, I think if we're given that platform to speak out and, and just show our voices out there, I think um, the diversity is there. It's just being given a platform that's the issue. Okay, so there is there's a quote that I found from Vogue, uh, July 18th of 2019, and it said, fashion's move towards inclusion has been mostly reactionary. Mm. Um, and it's, it's a very important move to make. Um, and also I'll read you another quote. It says companies with above average diversity in management produced innovation revenue. Um, they had 19 percentage points higher than companies with below uh, average diversity leadership. So it is something that is real, but how do we, how do you feel about uh, fashion being reactionary to it? Like. I guess it was something that we kind of yelled out and said, hey, we want to see more of our skin tones. Um, and then they kind of came with it. So it's something we can stay on top of. I think it has to be more than just being able to see ourselves in like a campaign, um, seeing a woman of color. It also has to be, you can't, um, you can't just hire a model of color. You also have to uh, hire a makeup artist that understands and knows how to do the makeup for that model of color. Um, there have been situations where I've been at photo shoots and the makeup artist has never done a model of color. And so she doesn't understand how to do it. So it's at every aspect. And you also have to consider your marketing team. Um, a lot of these brands have got it wrong um, when you think, hey, how did no one in your meeting call out that this might not be appropriate 
for a certain culture, but that's because they didn't invest and hire people of different backgrounds that are able to notify them in these meetings that, hey, this is not appropriate for this culture. Like in terms of uh, being diverse, you have to be diverse in every aspect. And again, I think brands get it wrong in terms of like, people aren't asking, just hire me because I'm a person of color, but it's hire so your team's diverse, your brand's diverse. You can actually reach different target markets rather than just one singular one or try to be the cool brand in that moment and get it wrong because you haven't been able to be diverse enough and you don't have voices that are diverse. Well said. And we've seen that. We've seen companies do that, like Gucci um, has done it. Gucci had, uh, they had an indie turban. Um, they also had, um, I hope I'm saying this right, Balaklava, the jumper. Um, Prada did it with um, they they had a keychain that kind of that kind of looked like blackface imagery, and so I always wondered is who made this call, you know, like how how did this how <laughs> the people on top who who decided this was okay without doing a little bit of research or you know seeing how how this could offend people. Do you guys have any other examples? like that or some things that you've seen before where you've just been like, wow, this is so inappropriate. How did this end up in stores? We see it yeah. a lot with with makeup and and hair brand, you know, like hair. Uh, you know, you'll you'll get um a commercial where somebody's wearing a full on weave and all of a sudden they're like, this is for natural hair. And you're like, wait a minute, she's wearing a full on weave. How is this for natural hair? You know sure. Things, things like that, or or hair color, you know, that has nothing to do with hair that is coiled, where you know for a fact that if you use that particular product, your hair is going to completely fall out, or you have big companies that are selling eyeshadow palettes that have zero pigment, and yet they go, they're saying it's diversity and it's for everybody, and you're thinking, was there anybody in that meeting feeling you know, uh, looking at the texture, understanding anyone's yeah. skin. I mean, this happens a lot. That's yeah. too bad. It's... Lewis, have, have you seen anything like this? Like, Well, well for me, when I did my um, photo shoot for my website, I went across the board, but my main uh, model was an African-American guy. And I'm I'm like, am I gonna get backlash? <laughs> it's totally different, right, from the Latino community. Look at, look how good looking he looks in the suit. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's about the suit, not about the person. So it's really in my industry is how you look, how you carry yourself, where you're going, who are you meeting, and who do you get to be? Like I say, transformation in a suit. So I was open and. I didn't care about the backlash. I was really open on doing this th on that platform of that was my main model. This is my first um, photo shoot and everybody was okay with it. You know, yeah. in my mind, I thought, oh, they're going to do this. But that's just my mind as a, as, as a person of fashion, what they think. What are they going to think? And after that, I just put it to rest and I just went with it. And I'm so happy with that photo shoot. I get to do another one soon. Great. Great. Well, there is, I think there is, um, there's a fine line between cultural, or maybe there isn't a fine line uh, between cultural appropriation and cultural appreciation. Mm -hmm. So that's always been something like Selena. We have Selena Gomez. Um, and she's in Indian clothes and she's wearing a bindi and, uh, you know, I'm East Indian. And I remember at this time, everyone kind of went wild because they, they felt like she was culturally appropriating. And for me, I was like, she looks beautiful. And I'm, I'm so happy that people are seeing the clothes that my people wear. Um, so for me, that was an instance where I felt like it was appreciation and not appropriation. So where is a line for everyone here? And you know what? What do you consider appropriation or appreciation? And where where do you uh, draw that line? I can answer. Um, so actually, before I go to that one, Sabina, I just wanted to make a comment on your previous one. Um, yes, please do. Yeah. So on the, I think it was the Dove commercial where they had like a black girl, and then she's I don't know whether she was taking a shower or something, and then she turns into a white girl, something similar. Oh but, wow. Um, 
to me, I was like, okay, so this, I'm pretty sure companies know exactly what they're doing. So there's this thing in marketing that no, no publicity is bad. Like bad publicity is good publicity, right? There's no publicity that's bad. So in my mind, I'm thinking they definitely know what they're doing. It's all calculated. They know they're going to get some, um, you know, people talking about them. It's, 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 I think it's, it's a strategy because there's sure. no way, <laughs> you know, there's no way that people like big companies like that, they've been there for so many years. And I really do feel like it's part of their strategy once in a while to kind of like get people to talk about them and give that publicity and get their name out there. Um, so that's, the, the last question, and then to your appropriation question, um, I think there definitely is a thin line, and it all depends, um, in my opinion, on authenticity. Right? It goes back to authenticity. Is that person has that person been part of that culture mm -hmm. uh, or that heritage that they are? Um, you know, they could be part. They could talk about it and be proud of it and show it off. Other than, oh, let me just, I just saw this thing and it's beautiful, it's nice, I'm gonna try it on. So there's a difference, there has to be a story that comes with it, I believe. Because um, like if people just go out there and start, and start you know, um, taking up different cultures and just showing it off as their own um, like idea or own, you know, as if they came up with the idea, then th there's a problem. But I think if they give the story and they, they give the credit to the culture or to have whoever, um, it makes a difference. But yeah, definitely there is a thin line. I completely agree with Chippo, for sure. Because a lot of things what ha tends to happen <laughs> is things become trends. And if you have not been part of that culture, then that it doesn't make any sense. That means you're just putting on that outfit and you're just going out there. And it's one thing if somebody has seen, you know, um, someone go to India, you know, and, you know, contribute to the Indian culture, especially if you are a celebrity. Mm -hmm. And then people are like, oh, my gosh, you know what? She was there. She understood what was really going on. And yes, she can wear. There's, there's an honor to, to, to culture. I mean, it, it's, it's like us, you know, I'm from, from Zimbabwe. I came here. And I adjusted to what the culture wanted us to adjust to. And therefore, if I was working either in an office or if I was working in a place where they wanted me to dress that way, then guess what? I knew it. I understood it. So it didn't look so weird. You know, unlike if I just came from nowhere and started pretending that I'm something that I'm totally not. So I completely agree with Chippo. Okay. Pammy, what do you think? In terms of, you know, you do have to have a respect for the culture. Um, you cannot, a lot of brands do um, put on different shows and pretend as though they're the first ones to come up with it, you know? Um, and you, there's no background story to it. There's no respect or research to it. And it's great that, you know, say you threw on um, a whole bunch of African things, but where are those prints from? What do they represent? Like, do you understand culturally what what it means? And a lot of brands seem to forget that. Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, so the next question is kind of a question I've been really looking forward to because I really want to hear people's takes on how this new cancel culture is affecting creative choices. So is cancel culture affecting your creative choices? And is it making you more fearful to take risks in your work, in your designs, in your branding? Um, so I would love to hear from each of you and how it's affected you. And have you chosen to just push through and you know take, go the way that you want to go with conviction? Or have you been a little more weary and careful? I can take that. <laughs> so, um, for me, my designs have always been you know, inspired and based on my heritage, you know. So I've never really um, followed trends or, you know, done anything that that is trendy at that time. It, it's always about what I feel like making and what it was, what is inspiring me uh, based on my heritage. 
So I've never really um, had an issue with um, cancel culture, culture, and um, uh, yeah, it's never really affected me. I don't, I don't know. But, but yeah, I think in the makeup industry, it will always affect us, um, especially if you own a brand, because as much as unlike Chipo, you know, there's for me, my my makeup is is inclusive. So it has to include include everybody. So I, I can't exactly just put it in a section and say this is just for this and this is just for that. So I always have to be careful. You yes. know, um, it, it's a continuous thing. So it, it's 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 especially in the makeup industry, it will always be continuous. Especially if I want to make it among the big boys. So yeah, it completely affects me. So you're constantly um, making sure that it's inclusive and you know, there's no one can be offended by anything. And it's a lot, yeah. it's a lot of work. It, it is a lot. I mean, there's times when I want to stand up for, you know, what I believe in, in terms of my industry, but it comes to bottom line and it comes to money, you know? Yeah. Um, the, the, you know, I can't exactly really talk about full on blackness. And also at the same time, then my Caucasian, you know, um, family feels like, wait a minute, she's talking about full on blackness, but where do we come in? And I can't talk about full on Caucasian. It, it, it's, it's an ongoing battle. So, and that's the thing. If you have an inclusive, um, you know, company, you always constantly have to think of that. You always, you know, thinking. Well, that's, that's one of those things is that if you, if a brand caters to a group, some might call it stereotyping. 100%. Um, and if you don't cater to a group, then you're not being inclusive. So it is a very fine line. Yes, um, very much so. And I do feel that you, there are times in life where you have to, you know, compromise maybe your beliefs. Uh, but it is important to be a good person and also um, really stick with stick with what you what you want to what you want to do. Yeah, there's always a time and place for it completely. You right. know, I, I think that, you know, sometimes you have to tread waters until you make it. And then when you make it and your voice is that bigger yeah. that people are listening to, that's when you can come in and start picking and choosing and saying, this is what I want to be. But if you haven't completely made it, you have to tread carefully. It's just yeah. what it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, guys. So Lewis is saying something. Oh yes, Lewis, please. So in the, <laughs> men, in the men's industry, it's we always take a risk. And we're buying fabric for 2022. Spring of 22. Spring fall of 22. So and the trends are it's up in the air. It's just about trusting yourself, trusting the fabric, and making sure that it's appropriate for the time and it, it's it gets fun and it gets it's nerve-wracking and your hands get sweaty am i picking the right fabric <laughs> for the right client and then and it works so it's about just trusting risking and having fun in the men's industry about fabric and the certain type of client we have so it makes it fun Okay, so what do what do you guys do in your businesses to specifically um, to be inclusive and um, to create more diversity within your brands? What are some of the things that you guys focus on and make an effort to do? Um, so for my brand, I'm all about education and I was blessed enough to be in the educational realm. And I understand as an artist from every point of view, whether it be it from the lightest person to the darkest person. So I don't necessarily look at if a person's Caucasian or not. For me, it's all about colors. It's all about light to dark, and it's all about climate. So with that, it's very inclusive because there's something that everybody has, and that is issues from all over. So, for example, you can get somebody that is oily, that could be either Indian, Caucasian, or Black. You can get somebody that is dry, can either be Indian. You can get somebody that is completely light to the com 
complete darkness and you have to cater to everybody. And for me, it's, it's all about light, dark, it's all about weather and uh, adaptability. Beautiful. Um, I guess, I guess for me, it's kind of a difficult. It's sort of like different from what um, Jackie is describing because hers is a makeup brand. It caters to everyone. But um, so I've had issues with, okay, I've had so many things on my website where I was catering to men, to women, different age groups, you know, anything that I felt like designing, I was putting it on the website. And then it came to a point where, okay, who is my true target market? Who's my customer, right? Who is going to buy my stuff? So I slowly had to narrow things down, even though I still do for men and women, um, I just had to narrow my focus onto that one thing. So it's really hard when you're trying to start off and um, you're broad, you got too many SQUs on your website, you've got too many things that you're trying to put out there because production, manufacturing and getting all that set up, it's a real thing, it's, it's, it's hard. It's really hard to break into the fashion industry and get everything lined up. So narrowing it down to that one specific thing is actually the way to go. So when you hit, just have one item, two things, you got one or two people or target markets that you're, you know, actually targeting. So you can't please everyone. Not, you know, what I'm saying like you can't uh, cater to every everyone. You have to start off by just picking that one thing yes. and then you know, see how it goes and then you go with that. So, yeah, so my inclusiveness comes um, simply with my supply chain, right? So I got to know who is supplying my fabric, who is supplying, who's doing production, who is doing, who's doing the fast fasteners, you know, like all the little things just to be inclusive in that area because I also own the responsibility, you know, throughout my supply chain. So you want to make sure it's ethically done and right, right. So I'm ultimately responsible for all that. So I have to clearly and, and, you know, like be specific in who I'm choosing to be part of my chain um, until I get that product to my customer. Okay. Anyone else, Pammy, how do you, how, how do you uh, bring diversity to your, your branding and your line? So I bring diversity in terms of um, one, the models that I use, I try to include as many different faces as possible. Um, working in the industry for other companies, there were times where I would work, we would do a photo shoot and we we're uh, going through models. And at times we wouldn't be allowed to use models of color um, because apparently that didn't sell. And for me, I know that for a lot of people, when you look at a brand, you kind of want to see yourself represented. Um, but at the same time, you can't always use everyone of every different shade. So I try to rotate in different models of different colors so that everyone feels included. And I also do a lot of different sizes. And that's why every piece is made to order. That allows us to produce at a slower rate. And so we're more sustainable. And because I know my team, I know my sewers, I know my cutters, I know my pattern makers. Uh, I know my team here, I know my team in South Africa. Um, and that way I choose to, I choose my team and I include them in everything that I do, but I also include um, different size ranges. So the size zero girl can get a, a, a piece and then the size 22 girl can also get a piece. So everybody's included in terms of sizing. Okay, great, you guys. Um, so after talking about all this, what are, let's talk about some action items, like things that we can, uh, do to, to change the face of fashion. Um, so I'll tell you that being from, um, an Indian family where generally it's, it's not a very, uh, it's not a reliable career to go into any type of art, at least this is how it was, uh, 15, 20 years ago. Um, and it was more going into traditional fields like uh, medicine or being an attorney or things like that. Um, so for me, I think it's really important to teach our children and our youth that it is very possible to have successful careers in artistic fields um, and to bring lots of culture to the table and that it's, it's completely possible and it can be done because uh, I do feel that it starts from the top. So how do you guys feel? Tell us some things that you think we or everyone any brand should put into action 
in order to build our diversity in the industry? I think for, this is what I believe. And I think for, that, that for all the companies to be diverse, we, the people that are the, the minorities should be able to support one another. I think it starts with really us because if we don't fight for ourselves, there is no way we're going to make it amongst anybody yeah. else. It's like anything in life, right? Yeah. You know, if you're passionate about what you do, um, you'll be able to fight for it. So I think it starts with the minorities. We need to work harder in supporting each other. We need to believe in each other. We need to believe in ourselves. And we need to aim for positions that are higher instead of being very comfortable in the positions that we are we in. And that comes from support amongst each other. You know, seeing somebody at the top and hiring and believing that somebody else that looks like you can actually do the job and not being in that mindset of, oh my gosh, I have seen a Caucasian in this position. They're excellent at it. So that is exactly who I should go for. It's us exploring and also believing in ourselves that there's somebody like us that can actually do the job. Thank you. Louis, what do you say? I, I believe in philanthropy. And um, in the inner city where I grew up, there's, um, and it's always, for, you know, for women, uh, there's one called Girls Today, Women Tomorrow. And then there's other ones that do prom dresses for the young ladies, but there hasn't been anything for the young kids. So in the last couple of days, I've been thinking, wow, what about the young man that doesn't have guidance? Uh, that doesn't know how to uh, go to an interview or doesn't know how to dress for an interview. So, you know, I'm putting together a program that's going to be called the young gentleman and for them to maybe be in fashion one day or to know how to dress and to wear the right items and go out into the world where they feel confident and they're happy. So philanthropy and, and your own um, city where you came from to give back. That would be great. Thank you, Louis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with uh, Louis. And in terms of philanthropy too, just like mentorship. Like I've worked for a lot of companies where I have been the only black woman there. And I've, take, I've had to take the responsibility where I know I do need to work harder than my counterparts because I don't want someone else of color, another woman of color to apply and they don't hire her because they will turn around and be like, oh, look, she was of color and she didn't do a good job. And whenever anyone else came in, uh, any of the younger associates or assistants, um, I would always mentor them, like, hey, you can get to this position. We can work hard. We can get here together. So always constantly giving back as well. That's great. And Chipo, you you mentioned something great was about your supply chain. Um, I think that's a wonderful way uh, to bring diversity to the, to the table. Is there anything else that you focus on? Yeah, um, I wanted to... So when I was taking a, taking a, a leadership course, um, one of the speakers that came to speak talked about um, diversity and inclusion, and her name was Fazan, Fazana Nayani. Um, and she said, diversity is being invited to a party and inclusion is being invited to dance. But she takes it a, a step further and says, inclusion is being asked to dance and also being asked to play the music or to choose the to pick the music. Very nice. Um, but I'm thinking that for us people of color, instead of be, waiting to be invited to a party or even to be at, invited to dance or to pick the music, we need to have our own, like you know, organize our own parties, organize our own events, just like this platform, uh, where we have so many, like so many people of color that are being brought up to the table and being able to speak out and voice out. Um, I think it'll be great, also, even in the fashion industry, to bring that to people of color and just say, you know, give them a platform to show uh, even the young kids like what Luis is doing. That's awesome, you know including other people, but for us to have our own ways to um, to bring all those things to light. So I think that would be a really great way if we can start. I'm sure there's some organizations that are planning that out there, but 
um, just giving them the opportunity to speak out and, and give opportunities to other people as well, to, to younger designers, even at school, to show them ways and, and, and give them that platform because it's really hard to break into it. Yes. Oh, well, can I also it. add something? Can I add something? Yes, please. Um, and also being able to be loud enough to educate our friends and counterparts that it's not a trend. So for example, Black Lives Matter. You know, I, I think a lot of times what tends to happen when things like that happen for other people, it's a trend. And at that moment in time, they participate. But being able to tell minorities to call out companies that have promised, you know, when Black Lives Matters, you know, were mattered, you know, for us, it matters throughout. But, you know, for other people, it's a trend and it's cool to use at that moment in time. Sure. But, you know, I, I, you know, today I walked into a makeup establishment and I started noticing that, you know, there was a call to action in terms of makeup lines bringing in really dark, 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 dark foundations. And what I'm realizing now is these foundations are going on sale and they quietly removing it. And the reason why that's happening is because no one's calling them out on it because people have moved on. But when Black Lives Matter was happening, they started including all these colors and everything. And, um, you know, earlier on, I talked to Sabina and I was telling her that, and I was like, it's very interesting, you know, I'm starting to see this more often and we have to keep calling and keep banging and keep telling our Caucasian counterparts that, guys, this is not a trend. This is our lives. We have to continue with this. Beautiful. Beautiful. So that's wonderfully said. Uh, Chipo, you, you did steal my last quote for this podcast. It was a beautiful <laughs> quote. I had it right here highlighted. <laughs> um, but it's it's wonderful. And I think it's so it's so it's an easy way for people to understand what diversity is and what inclusiveness is and what the differences are. And so you said diversity is being invited to the party and inclusion is being asked to dance. Um, Verna Myers is what I have, but we're on the, we're on the same page. We're on the same page. Um, so I think that's a really beautiful way to understand, understand it. Right. Yeah. You guys, I want to thank all of you for taking the time, for giving your thoughts. It's a really important conversation. And I don't think that we can learn and understand each other until we have these conversations and until we're real with each other. So, um, I want to thank you guys all for your time and your thoughts. Thank you. Thanks. Everyone. And your beautiful art. Thank, art. <laughs> Thank you for having us. So it's a wonderful platform. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Great. You have been watching Shady Choices, Colorism and the Shifting Face of Fashion. This has been part of the Non-Obvious Beyond Diversity Summit. For more fascinating stories like this, please visit www.nonobviousdiversity.com. And also our official uh, summit hashtag is going to be um, hashtag non obvious diversity. Thank you for joining us. I'm Sabina Shaw, and remember, always stay non obvious. <laughs>